All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Bio 153. And today we're going to be going over chapter 20 on heart anatomy and physiology. And this is probably one of my uh, favorite chapters. I hope it's one of your favorite chapters, too. A lot of very important information here if you're going into the allied health field um, and especially for nursing. So here we go. Let's take a look, eh? So why is it important to learn about the cardiovascular system? Well, still one of the number one um, killers really in North America is heart disease. And so it's very important to make sure that you're eating a healthy diet, that you are exercising. Um, those are very key for many Americans because the majority of Americans aren't getting enough um exercise and they're not eating a well-balanced diet to fruits and vegetables and lean proteins so very important to think of nutrition because that can go a long ways um, to keeping your heart healthy and proper blood flow um, because if not um, well then we're we are talking about maybe a blood clot and maybe that leads to perhaps a stroke or maybe heart attack or something along those lines so it is very important to consider nutrition, consider um, that, that diet, that lifestyle habits. And so that really is a big player when we think of this entire chapter today. So we start off by looking at the location of the heart. And so uh, when we look at, well, where is that location? So in this image here, the heart is right here and it's enclosed with an area known as the median steinum so the mediastinum and this is the medial cavity of the thorax the heart is positioned superior to the diaphragm the diaphragm here is a very important muscle that's utilized for breathing and posterior to the sternum so found below the sternum here this uh, bone right here, the breastbone. And of course, there's many different intricate parts to that. So maybe you've known someone who's had open heart surgery. Maybe it's a loved one. Maybe it's a friend, a neighbor. And in order for anyone to go ahead and operate on the heart, uh, when we're thinking of uh, the surgeon in there, they need to actually uh, cut through the sternum bone pull the ribs back and then they're able to go ahead and per se operate on the heart here and typically then you know someone's had the surgery because there's diff typically a scar that um, runs down really the median of the the chest here going uh, through the heart here um, and farther down so kind of an interesting kind of type of concept here have you ever wondered how big your heart is maybe you hear the expression well this person has a heart of gold they have a big heart anatomically speaking though the heart is approximately the size of your fist so if you think of your fist you know maybe you have it in front of you and you know you can kind of get an idea of what that size of that human heart is now in lab in laboratory we um, don't use human hearts. I wish I could say, you know, oh, we're going to pull out the cadaver and, you know, you're going to work on Larry today. But uh, we work with sheep hearts and the sheep heart is a really nice um, organ to, to work with, animal to work with, because the sheep heart is approximately about the same size as the human heart. And anatomically, almost everything's about the same. So it works out very well in the lab. In order to see the heart though, there is a structure that covers the heart and that's known as the pericardium. So that's a double walled sac. And in this picture here, the pericardium has been cut. It's kind of this uh, white type of material here. So you can kind of see the lining of where that pericardium has been cut. And then once you 
cut through that, you can then actually see the heart. The apex of the heart here, this is typically the most inferior left portion of the heart here. So this is kind of a regional area of the heart. We're now going to take a look at the layers of the pericardium. So starting off, number one, we look at the fibrous pericardium fibrous pericardium and this is the most superficial structure it's very critical for protection anchoring and preventing overfilling of the heart with blood so structurally if we take a look at that on the diagram here this outermost layer here is going to be that fibrous pericardium number two we have what's known as the parietal layer. So the parietal layer of the pericardium is going to line the internal surface of the fibrous pericardium. So on the diagram here, it's going to be this vicinity right here. And then number three, the third layer of the pericardium is known as the visceral layer. And this layer lines the, it's the external surface of the heart. So if we take a look at that on the diagram here, it's going to be this white structure right there. Now, if we're talking about heart wall layers, this section here actually would be defined as the epicardium, the outermost wall layer. But since we're talking about the pericardium, this area here is known as the visceral layer. Between the parietal layer and the visceral layer, we have what's known as the pericardial cavity. So this is a fluid-filled, friction-free environment. This is going to allow for the heart to go ahead and undergo its contractions, assisting with the uh, not a whole lot of resistance. So that area here, this area right here would be that pericardial cavity. So it's between the parietal layer and the visceral layer of the pericardium. We continue now by looking at the layers of the heart wall. And these are very important to make sure to know. So number one, the first heart wall layer is known as the epicardium. Epicardium. So this layer is the most superficial heart wall layer. Typically, there may be fat found in this layer as well, infiltrated within the fatty tissue. And structurally on this diagram then, again, it's going to be this white portion here. So that's the epicardium, the most outside heart wall layer. When we break down what this word really means, uh, the epa is referring to superficial, just like when you had um, epidermis, when you're looking at skin. The cardium there, of course, is referring more to the actual heart itself. Okay, number two, the myocardium. This is the middle heart wall layer. It is the thickest layer, and it contains the cardiac muscle cells. This is the layer that's actually going to go through the heart contraction as well. So on this diagram here, it's this very thick middle heart wall layer that you see here, where all those cardiac muscle cells are found. And again, very important when it comes to heart contraction. And then finally, number three, we have the endocardium. So the endocardium is the innermost heart wall layer. It's going to line the heart chamber. So it's going to line your ventricles right and left. It's going to line the atria, the right atrium, left atrium. And not only that, but it also covers the fibrous skeleton of the actual valves. Our AV valves and 
are semi-lunar valves. So very important to make sure that you know the heart wall layers. And again, with the endocardium, where we find that on the diagram here, we're talking about this very thin layer here that's kind of white. This diagram here, again, is focusing on the myocardium of the heart, that middle heart wall layer. And it's figured as a crisscrossing pattern, almost like a figure eight. Uh, the way the cardiac muscle bundles are arranged. And the importance of this arrangement is for anchoring of the cardiac muscle fibers. It's going to support major blood vessels nearby, like the aorta or maybe the um, superior vena cava, and even valves. So uh, the AV valves, the semilunar valves, and the arrangement is also important for limiting the spread of the action potentials down particular pathways. So there's a proper overall direction that the electrical signals will be firing throughout the heart, ultimately, which is key for the heart then to contract. So there is a purpose to the configuration of the myocardium. We now take a look at a very large diagram of the heart. And at first we might look at this and, you know, we might be like, oh, I'm overwhelmed. Oh my gosh, look at all this stuff. But I promise you guys that we'll break this down here. Some of the big things to know off the bat. When we look at the human heart, there are four chambers to the human heart that blood will go through and accumulate. So. We have the right atrium, that's one of the heart chambers. So the right atrium is going to be right there. We also have the right ventricle. So on the diagram here, it's going to be right here. So that's where we have this heart chamber. Our third heart chamber is the left atrium. So on the diagram here, right there. And finally, we also have the left ventricle. So on the diagram here, this entire structure right here would be the left ventricle. Okay. Now, there's also a lot of blood vessels associated here. And they're broken down really into two major categories. So we have what are known as arteries and veins. Arteries are going to be blood vessels that you see that are red. That color is supposed to represent that these blood vessels are oxygen rich. So they have a high amount of oxygen, right? So a high amount of Oxygen, that's usually uh, shown here as O2. So oxygen-rich blood vessels. So they have a large amount of oxygen in them. The other thing about arteries, too, is that they're going to be transporting blood away from the heart. So that's a very important role that they play. Arteries transport blood away from the heart. Okay? Arteries transport blood away from the heart. And then we take a look at veins. So the veins, they're considered to be oxygen poor blood vessels. And they're represented by these blue blood vessels. Veins are considered to be oxygen poor. So oxygen poor. Again, the idea of O2 representing oxygen. So oxygen poor. Okay, oxygen poor. And that's because they have a low amount of oxygen. Low amount of oxygen. Arteries, again, they're oxygen rich. They have a lot of oxygen in them. High amount of oxygen. And the veins, 
veins are transporting blood back to the heart. So arteries, again, transport blood away from the heart. Veins are transporting blood towards the heart. We're now going to start looking at the direction of blood flow through the heart. And this is a very important property process that you need to know. So this entire process starts, blood's coming back to the heart and blood is coming back into the heart, coming into the right atrium. But of course, we're starting off with that blood being oxygen poor. There are three major blood vessels that are transporting the blood back to the heart. Very, very big blood vessels, which are veins. So the first one here we have is the superior vena cava. The superior vena cava is going to be draining blood, oxygen poor, from your head, your upper limbs, so that's referring to your arms, and also your chest. The second major blood vessel here is the inferior vena cava, another very large vein. And this is going to be bringing oxygen poor blood back to the heart, draining blood from the lower limbs, so referring to your legs and the abdominal area of the body, so really referring to your abs. And finally, number three, the coronary sinus. So sometimes we might overlook this vein, coronary referring to heart, sinus referring to an opening. And this is returning oxygen poor blood from the actual myocardium, the heart muscle, because the heart muscle also needs to be oxygenated in order to work. So these are considered like kind of the big three veins that are transporting oxygen poor blood back to the heart. So that's kind of what's happening on the right side of the heart right now. But what's happening on the left side? Because the heart is a two pump system. So on the left side of the heart, you have blood that's coming back. That's going into the left atrium. This blood, however, is going to be oxygen rich. And the blood is coming back into the left atrium because of some very important blood vessels here, which are the pulmonary veins. And you have four pulmonary veins, so two on the left, two on the right. And this is one of the exceptions to the rule, believe it or not. I know I just mentioned that veins have oxygen poor blood. But you gotta love anatomy because there's always exceptions to the rule. And that's the case with the pulmonary veins. Pulmonary veins, they're oxygen rich. Pulmonary veins are oxygen rich. So that is an exception to the rule. So pretty cool, huh? An exception to the rule with these pulmonary veins. They're oxygen rich. The reason why there's this difference is because of uh, there's two major circuits associated uh, with the the heart. And so that's one of the major reasons for that. But that's very important. This is an exception to the rule here. The pulmonary veins are transporting oxygen rich blood. And that blood is going into the left atrium. So now we're going to take a look at a little video here. Hopefully it's very exciting for you. And this will look at the blood flow through the heart. So we'll go ahead and we'll take a look at that here. And I hope you enjoy it. So like the video talked about, there are 
AV valves, atrial ventricular valves. And these are going to be the valves that are regulating blood flow between an atrium and a ventricle. So you have the tricuspid valve and the bicuspid valve, or also known as mitral valve. The tricuspid valve is found on the right side of the heart. So that's going to regulate blood flow from the right atrium to the right ventricle. It contains three flexible cusps, hence the word tri. The bicuspid valve or mitral valve found on the left side of the heart and it contains two flexible cusps. So by referring to two. This image here, we're looking at the tricuspid valve. So again, that regulates blood flow from the right atrium to the right ventricle. What's going to, this valve will assist with opening and closing of the blood. And there are two structures that will assist with this process. You have the chordae tendiae or chordae tendii. And this structure here is directly attached to the tricuspid valve flap. So the chordae tendiae are also attached to papillary muscles. The chordae tendiae also contain tiny white collagen cords. So in the diagram here, if we take a look at that, here are the chordae tendiae right here. They almost look like guitar strings if you played the guitar or the violin, violin strings. All right here. The papillary muscles are located right here. This is a papillary muscle. This is a papillary muscle. And so the papillary muscles are directly attached to the wall of the ventricle, which would be down here. So the papillary muscles also important with valve function. You only find the chordae tendiae and papillary muscle in the right ventricle and the left ventricle. That's where you'll find those structures. We now take a look at the ventricles. These heart chambers are significantly larger and also get a lot more blood volume into them in contrast to the atria. So first looking at the right side of the heart, so blood in the right ventricle here, the blood will eventually leave the right ventricle and will make its way into the pulmonary semilunar valve. And semilunar valves are significantly smaller in comparison to the AV valves. And pulmonary is referring to lungs. So if you're wondering what that term means, pulmonary is referring to lungs. The blood then will be in the pulmonary trunk and then the blood goes to the pulmonary arteries and you have two pulmonary arteries, one on the right and one on the left that ultimately will deliver the blood to the lungs. So the pulmonary arteries is another exception to the rule because pulmonary arteries actually have oxygen poor blood oxygen poor blood so i know back a couple slides i'm like well arteries are all oxygen rich but there's always exceptions in anatomy and physiology so pulmonary arteries have oxygen poor blood. The blood eventually then, we look at the left side, of course, over here with the pulmonary arteries, the blood uh, makes its way to the lungs for oxygenation. But now we switch gears to the left side here. So the blood we look at it, maybe it's in the left ventricle. It will eventually go past the aortic semilunar valve and into the aorta. The aorta is a very, very large blood vessel. 
it's the largest artery in the body. It has a really big diameter because so much blood has to go up into that um, blood vessel and eventually to all the body tissues. So very large diameter. The diameter would probably be about equivalent to a garden hose that you might buy for your backyard from uh, Menards, possibly. So gives you a rough idea here. All right, we're now going to go ahead on this diagram and trace the direction of blood flow through the heart. Very important process that you need to know. So let's start, how about up at the top here? And the blood makes its way into the right atrium first to this major blood vessel, which is the superior vena cava. And of course, this blood here is all oxygen poor. Superior vena cava, draining oxygen poor blood from your head, your arms, and your chest. Down here, we have the inferior vena cava. So this is transporting, likewise, oxygen poor blood. Oxygen poor. Likewise, entering into that right atrium. And finally, we can't see it on the diagram here, but approximately around here, this would be the opening of the coronary sinus. So I'm just putting CS there for an abbreviation for that. And again, this is oxygen poor blood coming from the actual myocardium of the heart. Now, eventually, the blood is going to accumulate here. A lot of blood volume. And eventually, enough pressure, the blood will start to spill into the right ventricle. And that pressure opened up that tricuspid valve. So now the blood is pouring into this right ventricle. Eventually, with enough blood volume here, pressure will eventually allow the blood to push up against the pulmonary semilunar valve and that valve will open up and the blood then will make its way into the pulmonary trunk from here the blood will then will make its way into the left pulmonary artery and the right pulmonary artery and remember we're still working with that oxygen poor blood. Oxygen poor blood for the pulmonary arteries. The blood then will eventually make its way to the lungs. So I guess we can make some room here for that. So imagine the blood making its way to the lungs. So we could say the lungs are right here. And this is where the oxygenation would occur. And of course, we have the right lung, the left lung. So important to keep that in mind. And then the blood becomes oxygenated. And the blood will then make its way into the pulmonary veins. So here... And here because there's four of them likewise the blood coming back here on the right side of the pulmonary veins pulmonary veins of course have that oxygen rich blood so oxygen rich and that blood will spill into our left atrium here Eventually, the blood volume will start to increase significantly, and then pressure will be applied against the bicuspid valve right here, or mitral valve, and the blood then will make its way into the left ventricle. So now we have all this blood pouring into the left ventricle. 
And eventually, with enough blood volume in there, pressure building, that will eventually force open the aortic semilunar valve. And then the blood will make its way up into the aorta. Again, the largest artery in your body. The blood being under very high blood pressure. And then eventually this blood will make its way up through these major arteries here. The aorta is actually broken down into many different sections. So this would be like the ascending aorta, aortic arch, descending aorta, thoracic aorta behind the heart. And we continue on here eventually um, in time going down to the abdominal aorta. So essentially the blood will be delivered to the body. So, very important to make sure to know this concept. Um, for me as a student, it really helped me to really write it out. Write it out and write it out until I got it correct. We now take some time to just briefly look more at the function of the AV valves. So, the atrioventricular valves referring to the tricuspid valve and the bicuspid valve. So first, of course, this idea that the blood is coming into the right atrium and left atrium. So blood going ahead and returning here to the atria. Eventually, with that blood volume increasing here, lots of pressure will be put up against the AV valves, which would be here and here. And eventually, then they're going to be forced open. So then the blood will flow into the ventricles right and left. The atria then will contract and this will force the additional blood then into the ventricles. The bottom picture down here, we're now looking at the blood being down here in the ventricles right and left. Ventricles will contract. That will lead to the atrial ventricular valves closing, the AV valves close. The papillary muscles will contract. The chordae tendiae will tighten up. That's important to prevent the valve flaps from possibly everting into a the atrium cells. So this gives you a little bit more of an idea close up what's happening with these valves. We now take a look at the semilunar valves here and a little bit more of how they operate. These valves are significantly smaller in comparison to the AV valves. So first of course we start off with the blood being in the right ventricle and left ventricle. As the ventricles contract the intraventricular pressure will increase here and the blood will be pushed up against the semilunar valves. So imagine the blood being pushed up against the pulmonary semilunar valve and the aortic semilunar valve. That pressure, the rise in pressure, the blood pushed up against the valve ultimately leads to the semilunar valves opening. So now you have blood up in the aorta. Now you have blood that's going to be in the pulmonary trunk, pulmonary arteries. So ventricles now start to relax. The blood is no longer there. The intraventricular pressure will fall. So pressure in the ventricle. We need to close the semilunar valves. So you will have some blood that believe it or not will flow backwards from the pulmonary arteries. And that in turn eventually leads to them closing. So this gives you a little bit more of an idea of how these semilunar valves operate. All right, so the heart, it is two side-by-side -side pumps that are continuously pumping the blood when it comes to the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart. Two major circuits are playing this process. So, 
First, we'll talk about the pulmonary circuit. The pulmonary circuit, as you can see in the diagram here, pulmonary referring to lungs. So it's all about pumping the blood from the right side of the heart up into the lungs, which are here. The distance that the blood is pumped is short. So it's a very, very short distance that the blood is being pumped. And because of that, the right ventricle, the wall itself is fairly thin. That's the way it evolved. And so this side of the heart, the right side, looking at the pulmonary circuit, ultimately the blood pressure is low. We're talking about very low blood pressure, okay? Low blood pressure, BP, abbreviation for blood pressure. The other circuit we're gonna look at is the systemic circuit, the systemic circuit. And when we look at the systemic circuit, blood is being pumped out of the left side of the heart up through the aorta through major arteries and out throughout the body the blood is going to be pumped a very long distance because the blood needs to be pumped oxygenated blood all the way up to your head and all the way down to your feet so that's a pretty long distance that blood has to travel. Also, blood pressure will be high on this side of the heart because of the amount of work that left ventricle needs to do to pump that blood into the aorta. And we got to pump that blood all, th all the way through your body. So the muscle of the left ventricle is significantly stronger and thicker versus the right. And you'll see that uh, coming up here. All right, here we are. So now we're looking at the anatomical differences between the right and left ventricles. So first we'll take a look at the right ventricle. Notice how thin that wall layer is of the myocardium. Very thin, and it evolved that way because, again, the blood is only being pumped a short distance from the right ventricle to the lungs. And because of that, this side is under low blood pressure, low pressure circulation. In contrast to the left ventricle, the left ventricle very, very powerful pump. And you can see the myocardium of the left ventricle is very thick, very, very, very thick. And this is important to pump that blood out of the left ventricle to the aorta and that blood has to be pumped throughout the body. So we're looking at very high blood pressure, high pressure circulation. Now, this is something that can really help you when you're in the lab and you're looking at the models, you're looking at your sheep hearts to orientate yourself. Am I looking at the right side of the heart or the left side of the heart? Always look at the walls of the ventricles. That's your key. So if you're looking at the right ventricle and that wall layer is very thin, well, you know you're looking at the right side of the heart. If you're looking at that left ventricle, it's very, very thick. That's a sign, okay, I'm looking at the left side of the heart. So that's something that always helped me back in the day when I was a student. All right, we're now gonna do an exercise here. So hopefully you're ready at home and we're going to develop a flow chart diagram and trace the direction of blood flow through the heart. So, very, very key, because you got to make sure you know this when it comes to the exam, of course. So, 
let's go ahead and take a look at this. And maybe you have a marker board at home to do this um, as we go through this illustration together. So first we're going to go ahead and look here at the right side of the heart. We start off with, of course, oxygen, poor blood, right? Because actually carbon dioxide level, CO2, is actually pretty high in comparison to oxygen or it's low amounts, poor. So blood is coming into your right atrium here. This major blood vessel here is a very large vein. This is gonna be your superior vena cava. And for purposes, so we don't get this uh, too cluttered, we're, I'm just gonna abbreviate these structures. Of course, you need to write out the full names. Down here, another major important vein that's taking the blood into the right atrium. Down here, we have our inferior vena cava. So I'm just abbreviating that as IV for us. And then right here, this would be the opening here where blood is flowing in, oxygen pour from the myocardium. And of course, that's going to be your coronary sinus CS. Coronary sinus CS. Of course, this major structure here, this is going to be your, your right atrium, okay? So right atrium here. All right, so enough blood is accumulating here, and eventually this is gonna put pressure up against our tricuspid valve. So right here, this would be your tricuspid valve. And now the blood enters into your right ventricle. So this is the right ventricle right here. Okay, eventually you get enough blood volume that accumulates here and pressure will eventually lead to the blood going up past the pulmonary semilunar valve. So this is the pulmonary semilunar valve right here. Okay, so pulmonary semilunar valve right there. So... So pulmonary semilunar valve. Again, just an abbreviation PSV for now because we are kind of limited on room. <laughs> this right here is the pulmonary trunk. Okay, so the blood will go up here against the pulmonary trunk. So PT for that right now. And then the blood will make its way into the pulmonary arteries here. So we'll fix that there. So pulmonary arteries, pulmonary arteries. You can't see some of it though, because uh, the ord is kind of on top of it here, but that gives you a rough idea. So we have the pulmonary arteries. And remember, they're still oxygen poor, right? Oxygen poor. Oxygen pour. And again, these are the pulmonary arteries here. And you can tell, yep, I've definitely been blessed with some beautiful handwriting skills. 
Um, so pulmonary arteries here, referring to the left pulmonary arteries over here, we'd have the right pulmonary arteries. And then from here, the blood will make its way then to the lungs. So lungs, lungs. Because of course you have a right lung and a left lung. So the blood will become oxygenated here. Gas exchange occurs. And now the blood is oxygen rich. So now we're talking about blood being oxygen rich. So oxygen rich blood. And the blood now enters into the pulmonary veins. So we're talking about the pulmonary veins and they're oxygen rich, these blood vessels. All right, so here we have that oxygen rich blood so it's going through the pulmonary veins and now enters into our left atrium right here. So all right here, we're talking about the, the left atrium. And all right, so we have our left atrium. From here, um, with enough, blo of enough blood volume and pressure building, the blood will eventually make its way through our mitral valve or bicuspid valve, whatever you're more comfortable with, I suppose. So bicuspid valve. And then the blood will eventually make its way into this really powerful heart chamber, which is the left ventricle. So the left ventricle. Eventually with enough blood volume and pressure, the blood then will eventually will make its way up against a valve right here, which is known as the aortic semilunar valve. So the ASV right here. That will be forced open, and then the blood will make its way into this very, very large artery, largest artery in the body, and this is going to be the aorta. And then from there, the blood is going to go up these major veins that come off the aorta. You don't need to worry about the names right now. The blood will go through that aorta and eventually will make its way throughout the entire body. So, yay! There you have it, huh? And I guess I can fix that right there. Doesn't look much like a D, does it? <laughs> there we go. So there you have it. Obviously yours will look much better than mine, but this gives you a nice sketch of understanding the blood flow through the heart. All right, now it's time for you to develop 
your flowchart diagram of the heart. So what's going to help you in your course packet, you will find under lecture handouts, a diagram that I've constructed for you. And this will help you um, as you need to write out every single structure that the blood goes through. So it's very important to know those major veins the blood goes through, knowing all the heart chambers, blood flows through, valves, lungs, etc. So we start off, and remember, you need to write out the entire word. We start off with the superior vena cava. So superior vena cava. Remember, this very large vein is transporting that oxygen poor blood from your head, arms, and chest. The next really large vein is your inferior vena cava. So inferior vena cava. And this very large vein is draining oxygen poor blood from your legs and abdominal area. And then of course we don't want to forget about the coronary sinus. And this blood vessel is draining the oxygen poor blood from the actual heart muscle, the myocardium. So then the blood is going to enter into the right atrium. The right atrium. With enough blood volume now accumulated and pressure building, the blood will make its way into the tricuspid valve. From here, the blood will now enter into the right ventricle, the right ventricle. With enough blood volume, pressure building, the blood now is going to enter into the pulmonary semilunar valve. So pulmonary semilunar valve. From here, the blood will make its way now to the pulmonary trunk. From there, the blood will make its way to the pulmonary arteries. And the pulmonary arteries, there's two of those, so one on the right and one on the left. And then the blood will make its way to the lungs. And that's where the gas exchange will occur. So this uh, first half of the pathway, we're dealing with oxygen, or blood. 
CO2 levels will be high though. Okay, so carbon dioxide levels, CO2 levels are high. So that's the first half of the diagram. Now we'll take a look at the second half. All right, now taking a look at the second half. So we start with the lungs. What I think that's an appropriate place here. So the blood has become oxygenated now. So we're now dealing with oxygen rich blood. So from here, the blood will leave the lungs and will make its way to the pulmonary veins. So there are four pulmonary veins two on the right and two on the left. From here, the blood now will enter into the left atrium. The left atrium. Eventually with enough blood Vime pressure will force open the bicuspid valve. Bicuspid valve, also known as the mitral valve. I guess whatever is easier to remember. From here, the blood will enter into the left ventricle. With enough blood volume and pressure, the blood will eventually then force open the aortic semilunar valve. From here, the blood then will make its way into the aorta. And again, this is the largest artery in the body. Blood will be under very high pressure. And there's many other arteries then that stem off the aorta. And this oxygen rich blood will make its way to your entire body for the tissues to be replenished with oxygen. And by doing this entire process here, we ultimately look at one heartbeat. So, ta-da! So make sure to know this. Make sure to practice writing this down. And I'm sure your handwriting is much better than mine. Okay, so we're now going to uh, review some of these important concepts that we've covered so far in this chapter, chapter 20. So our first review question, why is the left ventricle thicker versus the right ventricle. Why is the left ventricle thicker versus the right ventricle? So what do you think would be the correct answer here? And the correct answer, based off these choices, that I would definitely go with, I would probably go with choice letter B. So choice letter B would be the correct answer. 
Number two for review. Which of the following blood vessels carries oxygen poor blood? Which of the following blood vessels carries oxygen poor blood? So what would be the correct answer here? And the correct answer that I would go with would be choice letter E. So both A and B. So the superior vena cava and also B, the pulmonary arteries. Definitely not the aorta or pulmonary veins because they're carrying oxygen-rich blood. Okay, so from time to time we talk about uh, different diseases in this class. And very important if we're talking about the cardiovascular system to talk about the heart attack. So the fancy term for the heart attack is the myocardial infarction. Myocardial infarction abbreviated as the MI. And what happens here is you have heart muscle that dies because it's not getting enough sufficient blood supply oxygen. And so hence this is this area is replaced by scar tissue. Every time someone has a heart attack, the heart becomes weaker and weaker and weaker. So some people can sustain and have multiple heart attacks. Um, or some, somebody has just one heart attack and it kills them because it's acute. Heart attack can occur at any age. So people can have heart attacks when they're in their, you know, 20s and 30s when they're young. So it's not just the elderly that are having them in their... 60s and 70s or 80s. Signs that someone's having a heart attack. They'll have the angina pectoris. So very, very um, strong chest pain. That's typically a huge sign. They also may experience nauseation. They also might be dizzy. They could feel perhaps maybe some um, tingling down their arms. So those are all possible signs that someone may be having a heart attack. So something to keep uh, a close eye on for sure. This image here, uh, we're able to uh, see some scar tissue build up on the heart. And when it comes to any area where a heart attack can occur, damage to the left ventricle is by far the most serious and catastrophic. And typically we're talking probably more about an acute heart attack that happens here. And here we have scar tissue right there that's built up. So again, can be very catastrophic. So I've had family members in my family that have had a severe heart attack. I remember there was this cousin in my family, cousin Bill, and um, he was at a Christmas party on Christmas Day and went out to his car and had a massive heart attack, acute heart attack in the car and died in the car on Christmas Day. So you just never know. But you try to do what you can to prevent having a heart attack, keeping that heart healthy, and strong. We're now going to take a look at a little bit of histology. So it's really important to have a good understanding of the cardiac muscle histology. Okay. So when we look at the cardiac muscle tissue up here, there are several different structures that are important to be able to identify. One of those that's really key to have a good understanding of are what are known as the intercalated discs intercalated disc and these are vertical dark staining junctions that actually anchor the myocardial cells in place okay so intercalated disc and we can see them in this picture of histology here right here right here right here right here um, so there's a lot of them here one thing that's important to understand, too, is the fact that the heart muscle will behave as a single coordinated unit. All the cells work together for the heart to contract. It's an all or none event. 
other structures that you would see very, very um, small, on, perhaps maybe under a microscope, it, they would be very, very tiny though, are what are known as gap junctions and desmosomes. And these are what are known as cell junctions. Cell junctions. So, gap junctions first. Gap junctions, represented by the orange structures here, allow ions such as sodium and calcium to pass from one adjacent cardiac cell to another. And that can be something that can be a little bit of a trigger, perhaps, um, to really set the motion and play of the action potential being fired. So these are very important when we start looking at the action potential of cardiac muscle cells. Another very important structure to be familiar with are the desmosomes. The desmosomes prevent cardiac muscle cells from separating during the contraction. So we can see those here. Here we have the desmosomes, these funky looking structures. And of course, here we have a gap junction, a gap junction. So just be familiar with these terms. We now take a look at more understanding of cardiac muscle. Looking here at cardio muscle fibers. These cardiac muscle fibers are striated this type of muscle tissue. They can be short and fat. They can be branched and interconnected. And a big one, of course, is this understanding that they are involuntary. Okay, they are involuntary. So when we look at this muscle tissue, cardiac muscle tissue, involuntary, this is referring to the idea that we don't have any conscious control over this muscle tissue. You can't tell your heart to stop beating. It's not going to happen. Your heart is going to beat your entire life until you die. Just like smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is involuntary as well. And then if you contrast that to skeletal muscle tissue, skeletal is voluntary. You do have conscious control over skeletal. You have the ability to lift weights until you want to stop but you don't have control over cardiac muscle tissue. So uh, back in Anatomy 1, 152, you would have talked about how the action potential is being fired and propagates along a skeletal muscle fiber until eventually you have the contraction of skeletal muscle taking place and this idea of the sliding filament theory. The same type of concept is also taking place here with cardiac muscle tissue. So for example here, we have our pen, and imagine that action potential being fired along the cardiac muscle cell, going along the sarcolemma, and the action potential eventually making its way down the T tubulo here and eventually make its way to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And that action potential being fired along the actual muscle fiber. Same type of concept when we're talking about cardiac muscle tissue versus skeletal. So a good thing to review, of course, is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And do you remember what the function is of the SR? Remember that the SR, this structure is very important for storage of calcium, right? Storage of calcium ions, right? Because calcium ions were important when you're looking at skeletal muscle contraction because they um, ultimately are released. They can bind onto that regulatory protein, troponin, right? Um, you had your myosin heads, right? Thick filaments, thin filaments. So uh, very important there. And of course, calcium will be very important too when we talk about the action potential of cardiac muscle cells. A big thing too is when we 
also look at the difference really in the cell volume of mitochondrion. So with cardiac muscle cells, there's going to be numerous large mitochondria. And this makes up really 25 to 35 percent of cell volume versus mitochondria and skeletal muscle. The mitochondria only make up 2 percent of cell volume. And the big difference here is the fact that the cardiac muscle has a high percentage of mitochondria cell volume because we don't want the cardiac muscle to go ahead and fatigue easily. The heart has to beat your entire life. Cell volume and skeletal muscle is going to be much less, as you can see. And that makes sense when you're working out, you're in the weight room, and maybe you're doing the bench press or dumbbars or whatever you're doing. And eventually, with enough reps, repetition, the muscles will fatigue and you won't be able to lift anymore for that time frame. We're now going to take a look at the differences between skeletal, between cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle contraction. And these are three big differences. We've looked at many already, I suppose. But the first one is looking at the stage called depolarization, when you look at an action potential being fired. And if you compare that to an action potential being fired along a neuron, and an action potential being fired along a cardiac cell, there's a difference with the means of stimulation for the depolarization. And the difference really lies in the fact that there are actually two types of cardiac cells in the heart. 1% of cardiac cells actually have a property known as automaticity. Automaticity, the ability that they are self-excitable. And that's the case with these pacemaker cells. They don't have to have direct connection to the nervous system. They can still fire on their own without the connection for a period of time. Versus skeletal muscle, where all those fibers have to be connected to the nervous system. Another major difference is the idea of an organ versus a motor unit contraction. So when we look at the concept of the organ, we are referring to the heart because the heart contracts as a unit or it doesn't contract at all. The idea of an all or none event. And then the concept of the motor unit contraction, this is referring to skeletal muscle where the skeletal muscle fibers directly have to have a connection to the nervous system. And the fact that when you're going ahead and maybe you're lifting something, maybe you're lifting a heavy bucket or bricks or rocks or working out, you're not using all of your skeletal muscles for the contraction. You're using some of them. And then another major difference here is the length of the absolute refractory period. The length of the absolute refractory period. This is the time frame where the action potential is actually being fired from one cell to another. So this time frame for cardiac muscle is 250 milliseconds versus skeletal muscle where it's one to two milliseconds. So uh, that's a big difference there. We may think, well, milliseconds is such a small minute number, but the 250 is important in cardiac muscle, significantly longer. This is important for enough time for the action potential to be fired through that heart. So that way blood flow goes through and you have the actual heart beat, the heart contracts. Versus the skeletal muscle, uh, one to two milliseconds, a very short time frame that the fibers contract. So that's the end of chapter 20, part one. I hope you've enjoyed your experience so far. And until next time,